And so this discussion this evening is on the intersection of Taoism and Buddhism. And I can't remember who it was that's, that when I said to them um, something about Buddhism being influenced, in, influenced by Taoism and Taoism being influenced by Buddhism, they claimed that I was making that up. <laughs> so I said, I better, I better make this clear. Thanks, please. So as a preface, and, and you should have a handout um, that will tell you much of what you're going to see on the screen. And many people, I think, are, are not aware that when we talk about religion in Asia, we're really talking about um, a, a complex of religions that everybody adheres to. And I'll just give a, a general um, reminder to people, or maybe it's new to some people. When we're in the West and we are members of an Abrahamic tradition, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, we have the notion that, uh, that religion is something, is one thing that you belong to, i.e. that you can't be Jewish and Muslim at the same time, as an example. And certainly many of us who are older in, in here can remember when the, somebody had to convert to Methodism because they were Lutheran, you know, or something along those lines. Um, but in Asia, matter of fact, the courses that I taught at uh, Simon Drock, one of the several courses I taught and that Chris Coggins, one of the other Asian studies people taught, was religions of China or religion of China. Or religion of Japan, rather than just teaching, even though I did teach courses just on Buddhism, and Chris just taught courses on Taoism, for instance, and Tibetan and Buddhism, those were his areas. Um, we have to remember that one is Buddhist, Taoist, Confucianist, and perhaps a local religion. As a matter of fact, in Vietnam, that's called Kadong, and that's a combination of all three of those they have a term for that process. And if you're in Japan, you're Buddhist, you're Taoist, you're Confucianist, and you're Shinto. And, and I would suggest, I mean, the majority of the people are, certainly some people might be uh, Christian or Jewish or some other, but for the majority of the people, the vast majority of the people, they are members of all of those. And the other aspect of that is to remind people that the notion of religion, the way we perceive it in the West, really was not part of the traditions in Asia until really the 19th century, late 18th, beginning of the 19th century. Japanese did not even have a term for religion. So they were cultural. It was beyond, it was beyond uh, what we think of as we perceive religion. So Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism, because we're talking about East Asia, and specifically we're talking about China now, because we're talking about the introduction, the period of introduction of Buddhism into China in a, in a little bit. And so these three elements really influenced each other to a great extent. And it began early. Buddhism was introduced into China in the first century, and we'll be discussing Taoism in a few minutes. And so that synchrony of these started at the very be beginning of Buddhism. We just had a glitch. I hope everybody's back. Does everybody see the screen now? Yes. Okay. okay. We go back into the... Okay, we got to go back. We lost the internet. That was the problem. There we are. You okay. seeing the slideshow? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um... So I was, I was saying that when we look at the idea of East Asian religion, they, they, while there is a separate Confucianism, there is a separate Taoism, there is a separate Buddhism, there are separate local religions, and we can delineate these by the canon, by the scriptural sources and things such as the Analects of Confucius, etc. On the other hand, they all... They all um, intertwine in various ways. And so when, when, when one says, I'm a Buddhist, 
without even knowing it, you probably are applying Taoist and Confucian ideas to your Buddhism, though you may not necessarily be aware of that. And the Taoists are applying lots of Buddhist ideas to their Taoism. Um, and so today we're going to be discussing this Buddha Taoist relationship. I'm not going to discuss all the other, I'm not going to discuss Confucianism in with this. That could be a separate uh, evening's discussion. Next, please. So let's get, put some context to this. And when we begin with Taoism, um, that is one, you know, as I'm going to say in a few minutes, Defining Taoism is, is problematic. The Taoists have a problem defining <laughs> Taoism. The very first chapter of Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching says, the way it can be told is not the constant way. The names that can be named are not the constant names. That describes Taoism. And it comes in two basic forms. And the one form is a philosophical Taoism. And the other form is a religious Taoism. And Taoism is an indigenous Chinese religion, that is to say, Lao Tzu, who's uh, attributed with founding Taoism in the sixth century, um, founded a philosophy in the Tao Te Ching that was both philosophic and political. One of my favorite phrases in Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching is one must treat a nation like a small, like broiling or grilling a small fish. And what that means is that you have to be very gentle. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise you're going to make a mess. <laughs> right. And so it was written in the 6th century, initially, at least that is the, the um, convention. Um, and that was the more philosophic form that most people are aware of. However, it didn't become dominant in China until the 3rd to 4th century. Taoism didn't become dominant in China until the 3rd to 4th century. Like anything else, word did not spread rapidly. It spread from village to village, person to person over time. And so it took several hundreds of years before the people in China had absorbed um, Taoism. And, and remember, that China is an enormous area, and the various kingdoms did not occupy all of what we refer to as China today. China today is a um, hegemony that is, is really large. An individual Chinese empire would occupy a much smaller subset, but empires rose and fall, and as they did, ideas were dispersed from one empire to the other. And that's part of the reason this took several hundred of years before it really became dominant in, in China. And the Tao Te Ching focuses on Tao as the way or the path. That is, the appropriate way to behave and to lead others. But the Tao Te Ching also refers to Tao as something that existed before heaven and earth, a primal and chaotic matrix of which forms emerged. So from a Taoist perspective, there was a heaven and an earth, and before that there was just a chaotic matrix. They came together, and uh, the forms that we see today emerge from that matrix. Taoism did not exist as an organized religion until the way of the celestial masters, which was founded in 142 CE about the same time that Buddhism was being identified as a legitimate uh, faith tradition in, in China. And that was founded by Tseng Daoling, and about the same time that we have that happening, there was a lot of, of ferment in China. Uh, the Han Dynasty came a little bit after that, which we think of now, Han Dynasty per se was a relatively short period. So this is just previous to the Han Dynasty. The writings of Taoism reveal that Taoism can be difficult to understand as a central term, as I was saying. It's specifically defined as something which cannot be defined, 
um, the philosophy and central practices of Taoism focus on universal, holistic, and peaceful principles, such as living in harmony with nature and natural order. The Tao is often described as the universe, and living under its laws of cause and effects is easy for life. So the tenant, the major tenet of Taoism is that human beings are part of the universe and we should live in harmony with the universe in order to live easily. And that what causes our difficulties is when we are not in harmony with the natural laws of the universe. And, and that's exactly how they're viewed. They're viewed as these are the natural laws in much the same way that if you were to take a physics class, they're going to talk about the laws of physics, you know, the speed of light and, and that sort of thing. That would be considered natural laws, you know. Um, next, please. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Leave it there. Leave it there. Yeah. Don't move it. Because now we're talking about Buddhism. I know something about Buddhism. I know more about <laughs> Buddhism than I do about Taoism. For Chris, for Taoism, I should get Chris to come here and, and expand on it. Um, and as I say, Buddhism is, a, is the path of practice and spiritual development leading to insight into the true nature of reality. Many people might find, um, they might object to that particular definition, but I think that's a general definition that we can use. Um, it's a religion, Buddhism is a religion and a philosophy that developed from the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha who, uh, we all know, lived in northern India between the mid-6th to mid-4th centuries. He didn't live for 200 years, it's just that his birth and death dates are uh, ambiguous. We're not exactly sure what they, what they are. Um, you know, it's easier when you're Jesus Christ because you were born at the beginning of the millennia. Or, yeah. You know, that, that's much easier. Um, in spread, Buddhism spread from India to Central and Southeast Asia and to China formally by the first century. And it's played a, a central role in the spiritual, cultural, and social life of Asia. Buddhist practices include meditation, a strong moral and ethical code as a means of changing oneself in order to develop the qualities of awareness, compassion, and wisdom. An enlightened being sees the nature of reality obviously, clearly, just as it is, and lives fully and naturally in accordance with that vision. And that's the goal of the Buddhist spiritual life, representing the end of suffering for anyone who attains awakening. And as I say, philosophically, there's a great deal of overlap between Buddhism and Taoism. Next, please. Now look at these two imposing gentlemen. The early encounter of Buddhism, as you can see, it appears that they arrived simultaneously uh, in the first century uh, AD. This is a quote. In China during the early part of the Eastern Han Dynasty, at first it was difficult to tell the difference between Buddhism and Taoism. Enter Ming, about 58 to 75 AD, of the Eastern Han Dynasty, said of his brother, Yao Ying. The prince of Chu said that, quote, he reads the subtle words of Huang Yi and Lao Tzu, Taoist thought, while upholding the humane sacrifice to the Buddha. Now, I don't know how much clearer we can be when we talk about the synchrony between Taoism and, and, and Buddhism, and that comes from uh, some, somewhere in the first century of the, of the millennia. Lu goes on to write that Taoism and Buddhism shared many similarities from the very beginning, as seen in the Sutra of 40, 47 sections, translated into Chinese in Eastern Han. The Buddha was similar to Chinese legends in his longevity, changeability, and his ability to fly. This sutra taught people to purify their minds and to reduce their desires. He goes on to say that generally speaking, in the beginning, people could hardly tell the difference between Buddhism and Taoism. And those were the, the words of an, of an emperor at that time. Note that this is in contrast to Confucianism <laughs> in such matters as karma, rebirth, celibacy of monastics, and other issues. So there was 
friction between Confucianism and Buddhism, but there really wasn't much friction between Taoism and Buddhism. The synchrony with Confucianism occurred later, but there was always throughout Chinese uh, history, there was always times in which Buddhism might be ascendant and Taoism in, in a descending arc or Confucianism or other times Confucianism was ascendant, for instance, and Buddhism would be would be in uh, descending. There were times in which Buddhists were persecuted by uh, Confucianists. Seldom was there a time in which Taoist and Confucianist didn't, didn't really get. I mean, Taoist and and Buddhist get along. Uh, next, and then let me just make a point. By the way, I heard somebody snicker when they said uh, <laughs> Buddha flying. Well, in many of the sutras, in both the Pali Canon and the Mahayana Canon, it's reported that Buddha is flying above the group of, above a group of people, etc. So I'm not claiming, by the way, that he was Superman and could with kryptonite or due to the powers of, of the planet Krypton fly off into the air. But that's the way the sutras that's the way the sutras read, and so that's what they were referring to. I don't think any of the Chinese people actually saw Shakyamuni Buddha fly. Or if they did, I'd like to ask them what they did. Yeah. That's the other option. Next, please. So, as Sutra. So, described as a way of immortality in the words of Lao Tzu, the technique of self perfection was equally held as a path to enlightenment by the adherents of the Three Jewels, who claimed to have derived the secret from the Buddhist teachings as set forth in the Sutra of the Three kitchens preached by the Buddha. In all events, the double emergence, Buddhism and Taoism, all scriptures, the kitchens together, were diffusion of the apocryphal sutra. And we're going to talk about that just in a second. And so toward the end of the 8th century, uh, we saw that that became 8th century CE. We see that this becomes really, really popular. The three, the three kitchens I bet most Buddhists have never heard of that text. And it's, and it's an apocryphal work. In other words, it was a work that was made up in China, attributed to Shakyamuni Buddha. And it was really a work that combined Taoism and Buddhism and Confucianism uh, to a very large extent. Um, as Molier states, the work following the title and the names of the alleged Indian translators gives a list of the three kitchens, and the three kitchens are referred to. That let me let me just give you a little bit of background. The three kitchens are so called because within it it describes ways of practice, and they're referred to as the kitchens because the kitchens were seen as nourishing people, and so these are the nourishment centers, if you will. The other uh, translation of the three kitchens is because in that text there is material that talks about fasting as part of the process of meditation and so you're substituting the the fasting process for the nutrition that you would otherwise get the fasting and the, the meditation together as a substitute for what you would otherwise get from the kitchen but the three kitchens in the work Number one is the spontaneous kitchen of compassion and consciousness of self. And consciousness of self in that context refers not to being self-conscious, but to be conscious of the provisional self as opposed to the absolute, which is there is no self. In the provisional context, we have a self in the absolute. There is no self. And so the first one is consciousness of self as well as compassion. The second is the kitchen of the four steps toward enlightenment of the Pratikya Buddhas, the Buddhas who become awakened through their own devices, through their own natural means. And the Buddha and the non conceptualization of the Shravaka. The Shravaka were the disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha who heard the teaching directly and responded and became enlightened as a result of that teaching. And number three 
the spontaneous kitchen of being, non-being, and non-divine. I'll, I'll repeat that. The third is the spontaneous kitchen of being, non-being, and non-divine. And then the sutra expounds the methods, and I'll quote here. Reciting the method of the three kitchens allows one to be free from hunger, to attain clarity and limpidity of the mind, and to acquire longevity. Limpidity of the mind is a sense of, of clearness, transparency, etc. At the outset, one should believe devotedly in the three jewels, respect them, and permanently honor and revere them morning and evening. And without fail, by the way, I hear some little little bits of Confucianism entering in here. And without fail, contemplate them assiduously. One must also piously care for the masters, the monks, one's parents and relatives, close and distant. It is recommended besides that one be the one observes that one observes the six perfections and practice self abnegation. Abnegation, self-abnegation is not easy to pronounce. Say that three times. No. Um, meaning, basically, the one is humble. That's really what it's talking about. So that's an example of a sutra that expounded both Taoist, Buddhist, and a little bit of Confucius ideas. Next, please. And if we look at the other direction, uh, we can look at how... Buddhism affected Taoism. I mean, we, there we, we have an idea of that work, that sy synchronic work that was really um, referred to as a Buddhist sutra, specifically. This one I find really fascinating. And as you can read on the sheet that was handed out, the Bodhisattva Avalokitesavada decisively entered China at the end of the 3rd century with the translation of the most widely revered Buddhist scripture in each stage of the Sutra of the Lotus Flower of the Wonderful Law, referred to as the Lotus Sutra. It's the 25th chapter, the Universal Gateway of Guan Xin Yin, which is Avalokitesavara in Chinese, Kanon Bosatsu in Japanese, uh, which is entirely dedicated to the Bodhisattva, would have a particularly remarkable legacy Four, in the Avalokitesa Vara, Kunmen Pin introduced a new type of deity to Chinese religious life. The compassionate Guan Yin was glorified not only as universal savior, but also as a readily accessible miracle worker, rescuing persons in need of impending danger for critical circumstances. So what we have here is a figure Abu Kitsavara, who took the imagination of Chinese, both Buddhists as well as Taoists, mm. Confucius, legalists, because one of the other traditions in, in uh, China was, was legal, so-called legalism. And but the idea of Abu Kitsavara, of this being who through her compassion and and for those who don't know, Avalokitesavara starts out as a male and remains a male in Tibetan Buddhism, starts out as a male in uh, Indian Buddhism, becomes a female in Chinese Buddhism. And you have this figure, there were cults of Avalokitesavara. And I, I use the term cults advisedly. Don't, don't think about, you know, um, what was the one in Texas? Uh, David Koresh, don't think of cults uh, like the David Koresh cult, whatever that was called. Um, but it, a worship of the figure of Avaliki Savara was a way to imagine bringing more compassion, loving kindness, uh, a sense of, of um, tenderness in a very rough world. And so this cult developed. And in the, in the section I just read, the 25th chapter of Lotus Sutra, um, which is um, the cry regarder, the chapter of the cry regarder. In other words, Avalokitesavara hears the cries of the people who are suffering 
and responds to them. That was a very powerful image. Interestingly enough, that image becomes a Taoist deity. So it's a Buddhist deity which becomes a Taoist deity at the same time. And additionally, you have a section, as I, as I mentioned in here, where Kavalkizavara comes originally from um, India into China. And no, no doubt, the, the notion of Alva Yitzhavar came even before the fourth, fourth, fourth century, the 300s. But that's when we have good evidence of this transformation taking place. Um, and it wasn't just the, um, the teachings, the sutras, etc., that were being read, but there were statuary all over the place of this figure became a very popular figure for statuary and for iconography and as well as as songs etc cetera, etc cetera. she became really powerful so there's a borrowing from buddhist uh, mahayana specifically that had become much more alive in china and had really become powerful in taoism and by the way by the time um, Buddhism goes to Japan in the 6th century, 500s, around 538 to 550, depending upon how, what date you want to use. Um, Avalokitsavara Kanabasatsu becomes an incredibly power figure in, powerful figure in Japanese temples and Japanese life also. Next, please. I should be wrapping this up pretty soon. <clears throat> It's one of those topics I could go on for a long time about. Let's look at meditation. Taoist meditation is really interesting, as I point out here, and I'm, I'm not going to make a lot more than, than what you see on the screen, because Taoist meditation uses light uh, and energy, qi, qi in uh, qi in, in, and qi are both the terms that are used, depending on whether it's Japan or China. And that's the energy of the universe that flows through people. And from a Taoist perspective, you're born with a finite amount. You can replenish it. But as we get older, that key begins to drain away. And you're not as vital as you were when you were a young person. So young people, that's what you've got to look forward to. <laughs> Old people, this explains why you want to go to bed at 9 o'clock. Okay, <laughs> that's, the, that's the bottom line. <laughs> and so that from the Taoist perspective, meditation became uh, important. And what we're, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm not going to talk a lot about this because that would take up a lot more time. Um, and you can see it being practiced both in a seated form, the way we'll be seated, doing meditation this evening, but also in Tai Chi, Qi Gong, those are moving meditations. And in those meditations, you're physically moving the Qi within the body in order to enhance the Qi that's there, to add to the Qi that's there, to augment it, to uh, get it flowing more freely so that your body moves more freely, that your mind moves more freely, basically that you're not static. And from a Buddhist perspective, and, 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 and by the way, they, the Taoists believe that that process in and of itself is a kind of renewal, which they saw as uh, very similar to what the Buddhists were referring to with awakening and enlightenment. So in Buddhist meditation, people often think about the Bodhidharma, who uh, came from India to China in the 5th to 6th centuries and played a seminal role in creating what is known as Cha'an, later in J Japan is referred to as Zen, uh, in Korea is referred to as Son. Um, we often think of, of the Bodhidharma as that figure and he's, in, he's associated specifically with Cha'an. And in, in fact, what utilized from a very early time koan practice, the practice of unanswerable riddles, 
as a, a form of meditation. Jig Yi, the founder of, of the Tiantai school in China in the 6th century, was the other formative figure, and his Mo Chi Quan is considered one of the most comprehensive works, both doctrinal as well as a kind of manual for meditation. So those are really the two most influential figures in Buddhism and meditation. And this was in 6th century China. And we might add that Qi Yi is referred to in many ways as the person who is responsible for transforming um, Buddhism into a very Chinese form. The Bodhidharma was an Indian who had gone, gone to, to China, whereas Qi Yi was a Chinese figure and transformed it from a practice of Indians to a practice, meaning uh, East Indians, to a practice of, of Chinese uh, in the sixth century. And we could talk about that for a long time, but I'll, I'll pass on it. The final slide, is I want to talk about something which I think is is really important, and that's the uh, Mogao Caves, uh, the caves, uh, cave of a thousand Buddhas near Dunhuang, China. Um, the study of the Buddha, the Buddha Taoism, really began as a result of Oral Steins and sinologist uh, Paul. Hillow's discovery of the Magao Caves, and that was in 1907. And what was really remarkable about that were there were thousands of Buddha sutras and something like 1,700 Taoist works, all in the same cave. And when we look at the Buddhist and Taoist comparisons, it was already well established in the Japanese scholarship and it was Eric Zucker who established the field that's now known as Budo Taoism in the 1970s. So this field of study was really rather early in Buddhism's emergence from the 1960s and the 1970s uh, in, in the West. Um, and I, I, I really like this final statement that he said, the combination of the ancient practices of the way of the heavenly master with the southern esoteric traditions gave birth to one of the main currents of medieval Taoism, that of the high purity or Shengguing, the Lin Bao movement, strongly influenced by Mahayana Buddhism, emphasized salvation through communal rituals into which were integrated Indian conceptions of hell, bodhisattvas, karma, retribution, and so forth. During the following two centuries, other minor Taoist sect, sectarian movements also created their own Bibles, like the aforementioned scriptures of the divine incantations, unquote. So I wanted to include this, that information because we started this by saying, when I talk about the influence of Taoism on Buddhism and vice versa, people say, hey, come on, you're making that up. I've read Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching. That's really simple. It's not like this Buddhist stuff that's so complicated, right? No, it's exactly that complicated. <laughs> now, I can, why this isn't better known, I have my own guesses, but it's really just speculation. So I'm just going to leave, leave that there. So thank you, and if you could go on to the next slide.